All right, uh, thanks everybody for coming out here today, getting some pizza. Um, thanks for coming to the future of peer-to-peer -peer networks and digital music. Uh, this is being sponsored by the Sports and Entertainment Law Society and the IP and Cyber Law Society. Uh, SELS is a student-run organization dedicated to exploring the legal issues and career opportunities in the field of sports and entertainment law. And our panel today is going to focus on the recent Grokster decision from this summer and how this is going to impact the digital music market, uh, copyright law, and civil liberties uh, issues pertaining to the internet. Um, professor Boyle, our very own IP professor, is going to be um, moderating the panel discussion today. And we have three really awesome panelists that are here that are extremely knowledgeable in the, in the field of copyright law. Uh, we've got Whitney Broussard, who is a partner with the um, New York law firm of Silver and Mandelbaum and Mint. Um, that law firm has clients including uh, Ludacris and Third Eye Blind, among many others. Um, we've also got Thomas Sidner, who is a Duke alum, and he is currently an attorney with the Patent and Trademark Office. Um, he's also worked in the private sector a little bit, and he does a lot of work with um, copyright and IP issues pertaining to uh, domestic and foreign policy. Um, we were supposed to have Jason Schultz, who's a staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a digitally minded public interest group out of San Francisco, but unfortunately he got really sick at the last second, so he can't come. But we do actually have um, our very own Jennifer Jenkins, who is the director of the Center for the Study of the Public Domain here, and she is going to fill in rather admirably, I'm sure, for him uh, in his absence. So uh, without further ado, we will turn it over to Professor Boyle, let it get started. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackson. Thanks to everybody for coming. Thanks in particular to our panelists for uh, coming here and being prepared to uh, speak. It's, uh, it is, in fact, uh, probably an even more uh, impressive uh, panel, if that's possible, that, than Jackson made it appear. File sharing is uh, obviously one of the most hotly debated issues in copyright policy. Um, and some of you may know the legal background for that. But for those of you who don't, I'm just going to sketch out a, a few uh, pieces of background history and then turn it over to our panel. We're going to have a fairly interactive discussion with me acting as a kind of IP Oprah and quizzing our, uh, <laughs> our panelists and getting a little back and forth going. And that'll go on for about 30 or 40 minutes. And then at the end of that, we're going to take some other questions um, from the audience. So. Um, Copyright law, as you know, um, deals with uh, all kinds of media, with books, with sculpture, and so forth. But what we're focusing on here is music, and in particular, digital music. Um, copyright law has always had um, a, a focus on the line between the permitted uses, the uses which are uh, permitted under the Copyright Act without authorization from the copyright holder, those which are um, either fair uses or not covered by the copyright, uh, not covered by the exclusive rights of the Copyright Act, Section 106 at all, and those things which are forbidden. A lot of those lines are laid down in statutes, some in case law, but their lines also depend on technology and happenstance. So it's probably good for us to start our story with a particular technology um, and a particular uh, set of situations, um, namely the Sony case. The Sony case was the, the case which, uh, for many people, set this issue up. Um, Sony was another tech, uh, company that was introducing a radically new um, copying technology, one which the industry in question, particularly the movie industry, viewed with horror and thought was going to be um, the cause of uh, of great harm to the, the industry. Um, and if you looked at the fair use doctrine, that, that set of relatively uh, open and vague uh, standards that are laid down in Section 107, you could have argued the Sony case very easily either way. After all, these were entire copies being made of works that are at the core of the Copyright Act, which were being presented commercially by their original presenters. Um, and which were now being copied by people using the Sony VCR. The difficulty there was, of course, that Sony wasn't directly infringing. They weren't the ones doing the copying. That was being done by the people who bought Sony tape recorders. There were many of them. They were dispersed. It would be inefficient or perhaps counterproductive for the movie companies to go after them. So what they did was sue Sony on the theory of contributory and vicarious infringement, which the court kind of lumped together, and the Supreme Court kind of lumped together in the Sony case, but which are actually two separate kinds of third-party liability. The key here is, when should someone be liable for infringing acts committed by another? 
You probably know the Sony case, if you know it at all, as laying down the rule that uh, time-shifting television programs, that is to say recording Friends at 7 p.m. when you're not going to be there and watching it later at 11 p.m., is a fair use under the Copyright Act, and that indeed is one of the holdings of that case. But more importantly was what the court said um, in the Sony case. The court there said what we're dealing with here is a question of how large the monopoly granted by copyright is to be and whether or not it reaches this new technology. And the court uh, was actually quite hard on the, uh, court of, the Court of Appeals, the Ninth Circuit, in saying that they were mistakenly expanding copyright so as to give the media companies, the content companies, control over this new technology. Um, they were going to allow them, because of their content, which they believed to be at risk, to control this new technology. And the court laid down uh, the rule in Sony, which saying that where, uh, a, um, uh, where a device, a product, uh, uh, is capable of substantial non-infringing uses, sometimes the court says substantial non-infringing uses, sometimes commercially substantial non-infringing uses, in those situations, you cannot be liable for uh, contributory or vicarious copyright infringement. That case sat there for a while with people thinking it was very interesting. There's certainly a flourishing consumer uh, electronics industry that builds up in the wake of the Sony case, which some people think uh, happened uh, partly because companies had a nice safe harbor in which they knew they could develop. On the other hand, it turned out the content companies found ways to deal with Sony. They actually did pretty well out of that particular technology, uh, both renting uh, uh, tapes and, and uh, developing technical protection measures such as macrovision. And the whole thing went along very happily until um, the rise of uh, the World Wide Web, and in particular the rise of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing systems, of which the, the best known is Napster, and uh, the one that we're going to talk about today is Grokster. So the Napster case, uh, decided by the same Court of Appeals that had decided uh, the Sony case, and then later the Grokster case, which reached, reached the Supreme Court, presented a set of fascinating issues, fascinating legal issues, the biggest one was, was this Sony come all over again? Was this just the Sony case, but now applied to this new uh, digital medium? After all, this was a technology, said its defenders, which were capable of substantial non-infringing use. After all, these people were using it in their own homes to make private copies. After all, wasn't this just exactly the same thing? On the other side, the content companies couldn't believe their ears when they heard this. 53 million people, they said, are using Napster. There are uncounted files being traded online. This is perhaps the single biggest threat that the music industry has ever faced. It can't possibly be the case that the rule that the Supreme Court laid down in the Grokster case um, can cover this situation. So I'd like to turn to uh, Professor Jenkins first, who's uh, written very interestingly about this uh, um, uh, in a uh, piece that is featured on the Duke uh, Public Law website. Um, when the Grokster case was first raised, um, obviously the parties had uh, different ends in mind, different, uh, different uh, ideal resolutions that they would have liked. What was, the, um, what was the, the music company's preferred resolution of this situation? What did they want to happen? Well, both parties thought that the court might be applying the Sony standard, and the Sony standard was that technologies that are capable of both licit and illicit uses um, are legal if they're capable of substantial non-infringing use. And so the interpretation of substantial non-infringing use that the music companies were in favor of was primarily used for non-infringing uses. So in that case, if most of the people using the Grokster or Streamcast technology were actually doing legal things with them, then mm -hmm. that would pass the standard. And the reason that they were promoting that interpretation was because they had commissioned a study that showed that 90% of the files available for download were in fact infringing. So by that standard, most of the activity was actually illegal and it would not meet the Sony standard of capable of substantial non-infringing use. So did they want the Supreme Court to overturn the Sony case or to reinterpret it? Um, basically reinterpreting, I think, the Sony standard, clarifying, re reinterpreting it to be broader than what the actual language of Sony. Suggest. Because the, the Sony case quotes from, obviously, from the patent statute language on um, uh, contributory infringement, and there um, the language of the courts in saying that third-party liability is, uh, is relatively narrow. Uh, one case says uh, even one non-infringing right. use is enough, although that's probably a little bit of an, an exaggeration. So uh, this would be quite a severe reinterpretation. Um, the idea would be, what, 50 percent, 60 percent, 70 percent? Maybe the majority. It's not really clear. You end up playing a numbers game, and you end up with sort of dueling testimony, dueling studies from, from both sides trying to show how many people are actually doing illegal things mm -hmm. with this technology, how many people are actually doing legal things with this, with this technology. Now, Justice Ginsburg was doubtful whether or not um, there were actually, whether in the actual trial, 
um, substantial non-infringing uses had actually been demonstrated at all. Um, what, what are the claimed uh, non-infringing uses of technologies like Grokster? Um, sharing public domain materials, sharing materials, this is over P2P software, um, that are under Creative Commons licenses or otherwise already licensed, sharing educational materials, sharing research materials, um, that sort of thing. And there was a lot of evidence presented in the case that's cited by Justice Breyer in his concurring opinion, examples of Grokster and Streamcast software being used for non-infringing uses. So let me turn to Mr. Broussard for a second. Do you think that there um, actually is an interest among musicians, um, uh, among people you represent, you talk to, of using peer-to-peer -peer, uh, networks for their own purposes, distributing things licitly, or do you think this idea that these technologies can be used for non-infringing uses is really a red herring? Well, uh, one of the problems is that the artists don't really control their copyrights. Uh, you know, typically the sound recordings are owned by the record labels and the publishing is controlled by, you know, one of the publishing companies or, you know, administered by that. So it's, it's rare that you would have a situation, unless you're an independent artist mm -hmm. um, or an unsigned artist, where you really have the, the rights to, to authorize anything at all. So um, the artists, you know, I think, I think you know, you, artists are all over the map. I don't think you can really say that there's any particular artist viewpoint. You know, I've talked to some of our artists. Some artists you know, hate that stuff. They wish they could you know, kill Sean Fanning or whatever. Mm -hmm. And others are just you know, very lackadaisical. They're OK, you know, or they don't care. Mm -hmm. And others think it's great. Others prefer. You know, they, they think that they want their, their users to be happy. They want their customers to be happy, their fans to be happy. And they, you know, they trust their fans that things will be OK, you know, that somehow it will all sort itself out. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you look at. Um, uh, like the jam band scene, you know, it's quite common. In fact, it's really the standard uh, operating procedure for jam bands to allow uh, unrestricted trading of, uh, of their live shows. They allow people to come in and tape even. And they make it easy. They have taper sections. And, you, you know, if you go to see Government Mule or The Dead or whoever you, know, mm -hmm. you might want to go see, you're going to see a forest of, of um, microphones and things like that. That, uh, that where people are taping these things, and then it, and then it goes out over the net. The one uh, restriction they typically have is that you can't make money off of it. Um, so there's sites, there's peer-to-peer -peer sites, for instance, like FurtherNet, which is a very interesting one, which was built specifically with that in mind. There's no kind of advertising or anything. It's just, uh, it's just it exists, mm -hmm. where the users all share uh, um, these different shows. And um, there's also, uh, um, you know, through BitTorrent, there's uh, uh, a site called eTree that lists all these types of shows too. So these types of artists, you know, they're they're comfortable. They're okay. They want to build their fans. You know, they think that distributing music for free works out for them. Um, mm -hmm. And really, you know, following the Grateful Dead model, they were really the first to jump out like that. You know, the Dead have always let people tape, and they've always um, um, been okay with that concept. And and you know, they they've been quite successful over the years uh, by doing that. So on the peer-to-peer -peer sites, even the, the, not the ones that you're talking about that are you know, sort of specifically authorized and devoted only to, to live shows, but ones like Grokster and so forth, one would expect to find some percentage of new bands, independent bands, bands who are allowing uh, their concerts to be traded, um, people who are trying to attract a record label, sticking out stuff on Creative Commons uh, licenses, as well as uh, huge numbers of illicit uh, uh, songs, illicitly copied songs. Is that the yeah? You would see you would see both. I mean, you know, I think from the from the uh, independent artist viewpoint, I think it's more common for them to to feel that that's the only way they can get out there anymore. You know, that they don't have the resources to get played on the radio, to even approach radio stations very much. You know, it's it's very difficult if you're uh, uh, an unknown musician to get known. Mm -hmm. So um, they're actually quite. Typically, they tend to be okay with getting their music out there, letting people trade it. You know, if you go to their website, there's usually free downloads and things like that. Um, you know, again, that's not every single artist, but I think that the prevailing wind in the indie community is that it's a new form of um, a new form of uh, of communicating with their with their artists. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Sidner, you've you've played a very I mean, the the PTO has played a USPTO has played a very prominent role in shaping digital intellectual property policy. And I assume you're talking here for yourself rather yeah. than for the USPTO? Y yeah, no, I mean, that, that's certainly correct. I mean, the, the uh, PTO is, re is responsible for intellectual pop property uh, policy for the um, administration, or the executive branch. Um, the, that means that we also deal with uh, issues of copyright policy. The Copyright Office is actually part of the Library of Congress, and uh, it's part of the legislative branch. 
Um, but uh, the, um, the administration filed a brief in Grokster. Its views are, are kind of on the record, and, and rather than just recite them today, mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll be speaking just, just for myself. I'll, you know, I can provide some perspective. I'm not speaking on behalf of the government or on behalf of the uh, Office of International Relations or PTO. So let me ask you, then speaking, you know, as you said, for yourself, um, as you look um, as someone who's deeply concerned about this and who's also seen the policy-making process from the inside, as you look at a case like Grokster um, and you look at the claims being made here that this is partly a case about technology regulation, it's partly a case about not allowing content providers to regulate, uh, to regulate <laughs> technology, but on the other hand, there, um, this is, there are, there's clearly a vast amount of illicit copying going on on this site. I don't think anyone disputes that it's the overwhelming majority. How would you describe the kind of balancing process that goes on sort of either for you personally or if you were to describe it as an observer of the policy process, how does the government come to frame its position on that? What are the key kinds of issues or concerns that they want to articulate as they put forward their position in a case like Grokster or legislatively in the future dealing with these kinds of issues? Sure. Um, you know, I think the one, one key concern is obviously that you know, when we're talking about copyrights, we're talking about an intellectual property right, it's a private property right. One of the things, one of the reasons that you have a system of private property rights is so that individuals can make different choices about what they want, you know, what they want, what they don't want, um, what's the best way to package and sell, their, sell something valuable that they've created, what do consumers want, particularly important in the areas where you're talking about the creative industries where information about demand is often uh, obscure at best. So what, you know, maybe the p key policy consideration that, that's going to drive it is really what's at the core of all uh, systems of private property rights, and that's that we want to be able to make to di with different people to make different choices and have those choices be enforceable. So if, a, if, if one person wants to post their works on a file sharing network to, uh, for, for free or DRM wrapped, whatever they want to do, they should be able to make that choice. If somebody else does not want to, they should be able to make that choice and to be able to enforce it effectively. That, that may be the key, um, uh, I, I think, um, policy concern that, 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 probably should, that, that probably should drive uh, the government's action. Um, we want, to the extent possible, to avoid um, making everybody's choices for them. Uh, and then I think the, the other, a factor that comes into to play when you're talking about file sharing is that you know, to an extent you're talking about innovation. Uh, to a considerable extent you're also talking about repetition. Um, and you don't need to look very hard to find it. Uh, it's right there in the names of the cases. Napster, Amster, Grokster. Um, the Grokster case also involved the distributor of Morpheus, the distributors of uh, software called Morpheus. Does, you know, its name doesn't sound like Napster. What did its distributors wanted to do? They wanted to be the next Napster. Um, so this, you can see this sort of repetitive quality running through the, um, the litigation and the Grokster litigation. The uh, district court talks about how the software at issue is, you know, conceptually analogous to the Napster system. Um, and that, I think, also shapes policy to an extent because we know a little bit about what the concept was that drove the Napster system. Uh, it was uh, copyright piracy. Um, no ifs, no ands, no buts. Uh, Four-step business plan uh, behind Napster, step one. Uh, it's all in the district court opinion in Napster. Step one, uh, increase demand for infringement. Uh, distribute software, makes pirated music uh, readily available, increases demand for it. Step two, use that to, draw, to build a huge user base. Step three, monetize the user base so you can uh, make money off of it. Step four, use the profits and your huge user base as leverage to attempt to take over the music industry. So I can just, but maybe, I can, maybe I can just cut you off because I want to make sure we keep the, the sort of back and forth going. Um, now, you raised two points that I think are crucial. The first is the idea of private property rights as the um, fundamentally about making choices. Um, both choices for artists, I'm gonna make, what kind of music am I going to make and does, do people want to buy it, do they want to listen to it? Um, choices by consumers uh, and so forth, and that part of that choice enhancing framework is about 
as you say, applying uh, the private property rights is actually about enforcing them. But of course, the question here was about what were those private property rights? That was the issue in Grokster. Did the private property right, did the copyright, obviously there are both similarities and differences between intellectual property and other property rights, did the copyright include within the bundle of rights that you learn about uh, in every property law class or every intellectual property law class? Did it include merely the right conveyed by the Sony decision, the right to stop, uh, uh, to use contributory infringement to shut down any technology um, which had no um, substantial non-infringing uses, or did it have another right in there? Was there another addition? So I think the key question here is not whether or not there was copyright infringement. That I take as is a given that um, certainly after the Napster decision, after the decisions about whether this was or wasn't fair use, the courts had said, no, there certainly is copyright infringement going on. That, I think, is, is not the question. The question is, as against a third party, do you have the Sony right in your bundle alone? Do you have a broader right? And if so, what does it look like? So let me turn back to Professor Jenkins, because I asked hey, him. Yeah. I have a question though, on a, a, something that Tom was talking about, his first point, mm -hmm. if you wouldn't mind me asking. Yeah, Tom, you were talking about control uh, in, with respect to copyrights, mm -hmm. you know, the right to authorize copies, the right to authorize public performances, things like that. Yep. Um, you know, as, as you know, and I'm sure a lot of people here know, there's really two copyrights that are implicated in music yep. typically. There's the copyright in um, the musical composition, which is the, you know, words in, uh, in music, and then there's a copyright in the recorded performance, mm -hmm. the sound recording copyright. Now, um, with respect to the issue of control, can you explain perhaps why the rules are so different for those two copyrights? When, and what I mean is, is that when we're talking about control, if you're talking about the musical composition, the, uh, the, uh, um, the publisher or the copyright owner for a musical composition really doesn't have the right to control who makes a copy of their recording, uh, you know, makes a, sorry, makes a copy of their song by you know, virtue of making records out of it. Because there's a compulsory license that's been passed, of course, and part of a legal background for well, about 100 years now. Um, that says that as long as you pay this rate, you can record anybody's song you want. You don't have to get permission, you just have to pay them. And then with respect to uh, the public performances, um, you know, all those public performances are typically licensed through ASCAP or BMI and, or CSAC. And with, certainly with respect to ASCAP and BMI, those, that licensing is governed by uh, consent decrees okay. from the Department of Justice that mandate that ASCAP and BMI have to issue a license for public performances if you, if you request one. And they also say that those licenses have to be on fair terms, they have to be on you know, uh, equal terms with similarly situated licensees. Why is it that with the musical composition, so much of the control is not part of it? Why is it more about uh, remuneration? And, uh, and with the sound recording copyright, the issue seems to be one of control. Why are the rules different considering that they're both you know, musical copyrights? Um, I, I think the, a fair short answer is um, historical accident. Um, the, 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 why is there a compulsory li license for, um, why is there a compulsory mechanical license? Um, well, in 1909, Congress was concerned, uh, people told Congress that it had to create one, otherwise there would be undue concentration in the player piano industry. Um, not a big worry today, but compulsory licenses, uh, once they exist, tend to perpetuate themselves. They're very hard to get rid of. Um, and as a, similarly, when um, the performance right became obvious that that could be commercially important and artists began to sort of try to find a way to, well, you know, how do we police the, that right? How do, we, how do we tell who's performing our stuff or not? Began to form collectives. Uh, and they were doing it at a time where antitrust enforcement was very vigorous, and, and uh, there was an antitrust action brought, uh, and eventually consent decrees uh, that sort of govern uh, how, how that process works. And it's an interesting development because one of the reasons, it, you know, both of these restraints were imposed with the best of intentions. They really were. People who, did, you know, people meant to do the right thing. Um, and they did. They worked fine for a while. One of the reasons it's been so difficult to get music on the internet is all of a sudden when you move from a hard copy to a digital environment, the question of what action triggers what right becomes, you know, kind of ambiguous. Uh, and as a result of that, 
that's been one of the, those two, that sort of those sort of restraints on the on the uh, on the the rights of songwriters um, uh, and compo or, and lyricists have really been you know played a big role in making it difficult to get legal licensed music onto the internet. So you know why did that happen? Uh, well, it didn't quite develop on purpose. Uh, it's had some good effects. It's had some bad effects. But um, I think over time. The, the clear you know, there's, there's been a clear policy preference uh, towards avoiding that type of um, either. It's compulsory licensing is an overstatement in the case of, of the, the, the PROs, but attempting to, it's trying to avoid imposing those types of, of, of constraints because you know, particularly now, we know the market's going to change and the technology is going to change very quickly. And what we intend to do well by, by doing today may turn out not to work so well tomorrow. That, that's an issue I'd like to come back to. And I, I mean, I, sus I suspect that a little bit um, behind uh, Whitney's question on, partly just because I've heard him talk before, is the question of really how well the system of rights that we currently have and the sort of economic organization that is formed around them actually serve the interests of different groups involved. Uh, a lot of the debates here is about you know, protecting artists and, and is that really what's going on? I'd actually like to come back to that and maybe have the panel talk about what their ideal set of rules, you know, if you were all the copyright czars, you know, what would you actually do? And, but before we do that, I think um, we should you know, sort of earn your pizza for you, I guess, if I could put it that way, and um, uh, come back to this question of like how Grokster drew the line, because I think uh, that will kind of frame the issue nicely. Now, Obviously, the, uh, as Professor Jenkins said, the, 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 the company, recording companies who were involved in the Grokster decision had a preference for really uh, sort of restricting the Sony uh, exception, really either reinterp reinterpreting it or flatly changing it, to say, revising it to say that it was something very different. We have to look instead at predominant use, uh, um, uh, substantial use, um, maybe 50-50 you know, um, rules, something like that. And um, those who were... Uh, um, many of those on the other side of the issue, certainly many of the amici uh, in the case, said, you know, this is really not an issue for the court. This is an issue for Congress. Um, contributory and vicarious liability had always been uh, something of an anomaly. After all, there's no such provision in the Copyright Act. The Constitution says that Congress has the power to create uh, copyrights, um, to create copyright law uh, and patent law um, in the... Um, in the patent context, there is a contributory and vicarious infringement uh, uh, provision in the statute, not so in copyright. And a lot of people believed that that meant that the Supreme Court had some kind of institutional requirement to hew very closely to an established set of a contributory and vicarious infringement rules laid down, which had really been around since the, the, the 1910s, 1920s, uh, which Sony said it was merely uh, applying. You can argue about that either way. Um, and everything else should be left to Congress. Go back to Congress. If Congress wants to change the rule, let Congress do it, both for institutional competence reasons and for constitutional reasons. This is just not something the court should be doing. Um, so if you think of those as sort of two uh, positions, you know, just, you know, Sony is the, is, is the law and to go beyond it is not your role. Go back to Congress if, if you wish, uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, create this new sort of, say, a 50% rule, 60% rule, something like that. The court really doesn't do either of those. Um, can you just sort of lay out for us the basis, the basic um, components of the holding there? I mean, what, what do they do? What's the, what's the heart of, of what they actually end up doing to hold Grokster, or at least to, not to hold them liable, but to, to, to sort of clarify the rules under which the case is to be decided? So as you said, the court neither revised Sony to apply this 50-60% rule, nor did it simply say, okay, we're going to apply capable of substantial non-infringing use, and Grokster is capable, Grokster and Morpheus are capable of what Whitney talked about, having music out there that people actually want out there, trading public domain works, what have you. We think it fits the Sony standard, and the case is decided. What the court did instead was really interesting, and I think really surprising for a lot of people. Um, they imported a new standard of liability from patent law into copyright law mm -hmm. and said that technology producers are liable um, for what the users do with their technology, um, illegal uses that the users make of their technology, when they intentionally induce that infringement. Um, what does intentional inducement mean? I'll actually read the one sentence um, mm -hmm. standard of the court and then I'll talk about what it actually might mean um, judging from the evidence that they found to be compelling in the case. Um, what the court said was one who distributes a device 
peer-to-peer -peer technology, an MP3 player, what have you, with the object of promoting its use to infringe copyright, as shown by clear expression or other affirmative steps taken to foster infringement, is liable for the resulting acts of infringement by third parties. And um, the court said that there has to be some sort of purposeful, culpable expression or conduct on the part of the technology producer mm -hmm. to render them liable under that standard. But what actually happened in the case is that the court pointed to some key features of the evidence in the case. Um, and it said that this evidence suggested unmistakably that Grokster and Streamcast were liable under the inducement standard. So they focused there on things like uh, what Mr. Sidner was focused on. Earlier. The name sounds like Napster. Um, they have the, the, they're obviously catering to this community of, of people who are already uh, illicitly sharing music out there, the way they advertise it, um, their failure to uh, put in filtering, uh, uh, for example, um, and um, the fact that they are, uh, in fact, benefiting from it, saying very clearly none of these individually is enough. But it's the cumulative effect. So, Mr. Sinner, when I when I rudely cut you off when you were talking about Napster, that was pretty much where you were going. You were talking about those that sort of clear evidence. These are people setting up pirate networks. So, do you see this as a as a an expansive rule, as a rule that um, a lot of its critics saw this as one which might inhibit or or limit future technology, or you see it as uh, pretty pretty minimal? Um, no, I, I I think that well. Um, it's interesting. It did, the, the, the critics of this rule, of course, uh, did uh, argue that it would do all kinds of horrible things, um, outlaw iPods and Legos and this, that, and the other. Uh, interestingly, none of those arguments really made it to the Supreme Court. Um, it, it, they um, it were there only tangentially. Um, it seems to be arguments that were more for public consumption than uh, arguments that people would seriously make in, 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 in front of the United States Supreme Court. Um, but the, um, I think the short of it is, the, the Can you really, just clarify that because those were in the briefs. I mean, certainly, oh, yeah. certainly in the in the uh, both in the in, in the in the briefs of the parties, and certainly in the Amici brief. I mean, there were, as you know, many many yeah. Amici briefs, but them. almost all of them debated those issues, either claiming that this would be technology harming. Indeed, I would say that was perhaps the predominant area of argument in the briefs, uh, or saying, as you were saying, that actually the, um, the effects of any uh, of the various proposed enlargements or interpretations of the rules would have minimal effect on tech now, technology. I, I have to disagree. There was a lot of discussion in the amicus briefs about you know, revising, you know, reopening Sony, mm -hmm. uh, causing, um, having potentially ta technology damping effects. The other issue that was very much a a a at issue is, should there be any, you know, does Sony apply in cases where there's evidence of intentional inducement? Is it relevant at all in a case like that? And there, the, um, the question of, you know, can you have an, you know, what would an inducement rule do? Very, very little discussion. Um, you know, the, it, it, of, of, you know, the potential harm arising from that. There is a little bit in, the, in some of the uh, amicus briefs, very minimal. Uh, I was actually so you mean quite specifically surprised. on the intentional inducement yeah, argument? That's right. Uh, but as far as you know, what does the rule mean? What do you? Is it broad? I, I think you know. What are its implications? I, a couple things. Number one, for everybody in this room, it has no implications whatsoever. None. Um, the the short of it is for you and me. Uh, it's always been clear that if we intentionally induce someone else to infringe copyrights, we could be liable, either civilly or criminally. That's, that was, has been the prevailing legal standard for uh, some time. So for us, no effects at all. Um, the law hasn't really changed. Um, the only people for whom it might have arguably changed would be people who distribute copying devices and can thus assert, potentially assert the, you know, the Sony defense, capacity for substantial non-infringing use. That was sort of the issue. Um, does the same rule apply to them? And there, I think, you know, what will be the, what will be the, the, the consequences of, of um, acknowledging that actually the rule is the same for them too, I think they will be, that, that they should be um, uh, fairly, fairly minimal because the interesting thing about the Grokster case is that even as to that group of persons, distributors of copying devices, mm -hmm. there is no conduct that was legal before Grokster that is illegal after Grokster. The only difference is, before Grokster, at least if you were in the Ninth Circuit, 
If you, intention, if you were a distributor of copying devices and you intentionally induced copyright infringement, you would have had to have been criminally prosecuted. Um, they would have had to, have put, if they wanted to punish your conduct, you would have had to have been put in jail. The Ninth Circuit said you couldn't impose civil liability just based upon the distributor's intent. Um, then, but the, the, as a, the interesting consequence of that, and there are, there are really two, one is that even with the change, with the Ninth Circuit getting reversed, um, and, and now the, the only thing that's changed is, well, now it's clear you can be held civilly, li civilly, civilly liable too. Look, can I push you a little bit on that? Sure. Because I, I, I um, tell you what, actually, let me, but, but, I think I can back it up with pretty, pretty clearly. Well, but, but let's, 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 so I, I certainly agree with you that um, there was intentional inducement liability on the books. But I think the, the question instead is, as we all know, the fact that something exists, the question of whether or not it's going to be implied to a particular range of conduct are two very different things. Sure. So, um, so let's think of an example. Now, people use the example of the iPod. Um, in fact, Professor Jenkins in her, her article um, uh, sort of nicely uh, fleshes some of this out. And I'd like to, I'd like to sort of, you know, sort of push you a little bit with that. So, so um, you gave some, some reasons why at its inception the iPod would not seem to be the unquestioned you know, paradigm of all that is digitally good that it now is, but actually at its inception before we all came to love it and know it as we did, that it's actually not so clear that that technology escapes the Grokster standard. This is the question of chill. How broad is this? Might legitimate activities be um, undermined? Can you fl take us through your reasoning there? Okay, I'll say two things. First, yes, let me um, channel EFF, which is part of my position here, and they actually have made this argument as well. But let's hypothesize um, about whether iPod would pass the Grokster standard. So first of all, um, the court in Grokster thought it was important that Grokster had conceived and marketed itself essentially as the next Napster. They went after old Napster users. Their name has the suffix stir in it. And um, Napster had already been found illegal. So it was a sort of tainted advertising and marketing campaign. Well, Apple's slogan is rip, mix, and burn, right? Which could also be seen as sort of tainted advertising. Another thing that the court found noteworthy was that um, Grokster and Streamcast had not put in mechanisms that um, protected against infringement. Well, um, the iPod uses the MP3 format, which is a favorite format of illegal file sharing. Um, it's a more open format. They could have used a more DRM protected format. The third thing that the Grokster court found notable was that the business model of Grokster depended upon infringement because their advertising revenues raised as more infringing material was made available. Well, arguably, the iPod has a 40 gigabyte capacity. Very few people have that much legal music in their library. And so the 40 gigabyte capacity could only be for people to store infringing music. And I was talking to some people from the music industry, and they were saying, oh, we have the statistic that 50% of the music on most people's iPods is infringing. This is terrible. Um, so if you take those key features in the Grokster case, arguably, you can say that the iPod would actually fail under each of them and would actually be illegal under the Grokster standard. But you're not seriously had... saying that the iPod would now be actually found illegal in court, right? Well, that's the question, is um, when do you actually look at the technology? The, the Sony standard was actually forward-looking mm -hmm. um, because when new technologies come out, the iPod or whatever, you can't actually realize their potential immediately. You can't realize the markets that are grow, grow around them, what people are going to be doing with them. And um, so the idea with a forward-looking standard, like capable of substantial non-infringing uses, mm -hmm. is that you actually allow new disruptive technologies, the breathing space, to develop and find out what they're actually going to be used for. And that's what happened with the VCR. When the, when the uh, Sony case was filed against the VCR, the movie industry thought it was actually going to be really harmful when we all know now that the mm -hmm. VCR has turned out to benefit both consumers and the industry itself. 50% of their profits, are, or the majority of their profits, I think, come from video rentals. Or, or did until And so the, yeah. the idea is that you need some sort of standard. If you want to safeguard innovation and technology, you need some sort of standard that actually allows technologies like the iPod, like CD burners, like the VCR, time to mm -hmm. develop and instead of stomping them out just at their, inse their inception. And I'll borrow what you said, instead of stomping out the butterflies with the roaches, you know, stomping out all technology, you need to give them some breathing space and 
allow copyright to be a sort of incubator for techno technological process. Let me, ask, let me ask first Whitney and then Mr. Sid, uh, Whitney Broussard and then uh, Tom Sidner to sort of, to sort of comment on that. Right? You know, as you look at it, uh, Whitney, what, what do you see as you, you look at the Grokster decision? Do you see a good balancing of interest? Do you see something that is, I mean, obviously, to some extent, I think the people who you represent are dependent on technological innovation, but on the hardware and software level as well as musical innovation. I think that the problem, uh, I think that Grokster is, there isn't a, a clear standard. I think the problem with, with Grokster is that the decision, at least, is that it's so ambiguous that it just becomes a, a, a wonderful tool for copyright owners to go sue people. That, you know, you, you look at the, at the result of sort of what's happened now is that, you know, all, a lot of these peer-to-peer -peer companies now are just running scared because they know that you can't look at this. If you're trying to advise a peer-to-peer -peer company right now who's just starting out, what do you do? Um, the court doesn't really offer any great guidance there. I mean, you know, we have a, a few little tests. You know, I mean, I think that the, that, the, that the Sony standard was very clear. You could talk to people about what that meant, you know, and substantial non-infringing uses was something that you could really, you know, get your teeth around and, and you could talk to people about that. But with uh, the Grokster standard, I mean, I thought it was very strange, actually, personally, uh, that the court decided that way. Because if you look at um, the, Sony, the Sony case, uh, the Betamax case, one of the most important parts of that case, I think, was that the, uh, was that the court came and said, uh, copyright law is only what uh, Congress says it is. We don't make copyright law. So that's why the standard in Sony was very, very broad and very, very easy to meet. Because really, the court wasn't interested in making new copyright law. They said, that's for Congress. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll create this standard where it's just if someone's so evil, that they create something that can't be used mm -hmm. for any legitimate purpose, then, then that is going to be wrong. We'll, we'll draw that line. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to get into the, to the line drawing. And then, and then later, in, the, um, in the, uh, the Sonny Bono case about the copyright term extension for uh, about the extra 20 years, when uh, the you know, important part of that case, I thought, was the court came back and said, copyright is whatever Congress says it is. Mm -hmm. You know, that there is no constitutional argument, really, that you can't extend copyright for an extra 20 years or 50 years or 100 years or whatever it is. You know, that's Congress's job. And I really expected, actually, in the Grokster case, for the court to come back with a very similar approach and say, gee, you know, uh, we'd like to help you here. Maybe there's something wrong. But Congress is empowered to do this. And as a matter of fact, in that term of Congress, when this was being decided at the, in the Supreme Court, there was a statute that was in debate, you know, that was all about intentional inducement. Mm -hmm. And I really expected the court to, to go to punt and say, um, you know, this is really not something in our expertise. And I think that they've made a big mistake now because they've given uh, such, a, such a, um, a gray standard mm -hmm. that it's, it just creates fear, uncertainty, and doubt in the minds of technologists. So what happens is that you, you're just going to have people that skirt way around that berth. They don't want to get, you know, sued. Mm -hmm. Uh, so and then and you can't really advise a client, you know, a technology client or something like how you know how do you make sure that you're not going to fall in that uh, into that um, that trap of the intentional inducement? You don't really know. Mr. Sidner, I sense you disagree. I <laughs> I do. Um, no, I, a couple things, and I'll, I'll have to respond sort of consecutively. Let me talk about briefly, or, or let me address the Congress had to do this argument first. Um, it is uh, just. I, I would give it all the credit that the Supreme Court did, which is none at all. The, the fundamental coin in Grokster is, what on earth did the Supreme Court mean in Sony? Which is not necessarily an easily answered question. Um, the Supreme Court is, of course, perfectly entitled to say what its previous decisions meant. Um, and more importantly, if you look at the way, so you got to back up for one second and look at what is, what is secondary liability generally? Uh, because it's present, as the Supreme Court says, in virtually all areas of law. How does it tend to evolve? How does it typically evolve? Who typically sets the rules? The answer is courts. Uh, in most areas of the law where secondary liability applies, it's a judicially developed doctrine. It started out under the Copyright Act in the same way. Uh, under the Copyright Act of 1909, courts first in introduced the doctrines. They developed them. When the Copyright Act was recodified in 1976, Congress added in, in the describing what the uh, um, exclusive rights cover, the, the language to do or to authorize, to indicate its intent that courts would continue to apply the, the contributory liability doctrines. 
Uh, it indicates this intent again in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, by saying nothing in the act affects the doctrines of, of contributory and vicarious liability. Um, so it, it, clearly, Congress intended for courts to apply, uh, to develop and apply secondary liability standards. Why would it do that? Um, simple, and if you look back to Sony, the, I think the answer is right there. Sony says that with, where secondary liability is concerned, you're trying to answer the question, on, you know, is it just, uh, under the particular circumstances of the case, is it just to hold one person liable for the conduct of another? That is a necessarily, a, a, it requires, requires some case-specific analysis. Um, second, and if you look at codified secondary liability rules, like the aiding and abetting provision in the, in the criminal code, or, um, uh, for example, RICO, they tend to be very broad. They, they, they say things, but they leave a lot of discretion to the court because you need to have flexibility, they need to have flexibility to reach the right result. Why do you need to do that? And the answer is because out there in the background, secondary liability rules have a really critical function to um, uh, perform. They, have, they are the mechanism that we use for going after really bad actors. These are people who know what the law says, they know what they're allowed to do and don't. They tried to produce an illegal result by using third parties as their means. Although the, there is a, a real well, mixture in terms of how the court has done that. I mean, if, for example, in the Central Bank of Denver case dealing with the securities laws, the court said, right. oh, well, well, you know, we don't do that. So, I mean, I certainly take your point. This is something which had been well established as a matter of law, um, which had continued, which had, Congress had mentioned that it existed, had indicated no indication that it doesn't like what's going on. It sends to me that we can, and I think we've got actually a nicely developed disagreement here. One side said Congress was agreeing with the very narrowly drawn vision in Sony. Another side says what had happened was Congress had actually delegated this to the courts, as it does in lots of other areas, and the courts were the ones to develop it. I think we can go back and forward on that. I think we'll probably, I doubt, we'll, I think we, we'll, we'll generate some heat. I'm not sure if we'll develop the positions better than they've been very articulately stated already by, what, by each of you. I'm sorry. I, I'd like to, if we can, because we have well, a, I, I really need to finish this one. Uh, <laughs> I really do. Um, uh, you know, but because I think it, it goes back to the point of, the point that, well, an inducement rule is kind of vague. Well, yes. Um, I, I, would, I would not deny that. Um, all secondary liabilities rules, rules are because they're aimed at, they're, they provide a mechanism uh, for targeting people who are trying to design their way around the law. You think of the classic case of, you know, who is the aider and a better, who is the one you're trying to target? Think about Oliver Twist. The fences, Bill Sykes, Partner Fagan, they make money selling stolen goods, that, uh, selling goods that have been stolen by a gang of child thieves that they've recruited and trained. Secondary liability is designed to provide a means to go after them rather than after the kids. Um, and the Fagans and Sykeses of the world would love nothing more than some sort of instruction manual that would um, provide them with the means to run their op operation within the limits of the law. And one of the problems we had is that to the extent that Sony did provide, did provide a, a bright line rule, services like Napster made an absolute mockery of it. Mm. Uh, they showed that a bright line rule was going to be abused and had been abused, be and that's, that was the problem. Oh, I but I, sorry, but yeah, seem to like suing uh, children. They've done it like 20, 25 times. <laughs> 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 well, you know, I, 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 this would be a great one to go on, but I really want to get to one. There's one key thing that I think we have to get to before the end of the panel, and we could certainly debate that one um, endlessly. It's the question of how this system should be designed, because we've talked a lot. I think you've heard two different views on a number of things. To what extent is this about you know, child thieves on one side and, and virtuous property owners on the other hand, as opposed to to what extent is this about who, how much of the surplus um, produced by digital media is um, held by consumers, how much by hardware companies, how much by content providers, right? There are many ways to describe the issue that is going on here. What I'd like to get to, though, is the question of, as, as Mr. Sinner rightney pointed out, there's a lot in the Copyright Act that has grown you know, through accretion, the historical circumstances, the technologies have shaped, have given us a set of rules. Um, but supposing we stepped back from it and we were trying to design a system which promoted the progress, um, what kind of system would we look to? And in particular, how would we or should we change the rules focusing on digital media, because that's our issue, um, 
uh, to great to protect, encourage artists in a in a wider way. Are we doing that right now? Is that the passage we're on? Is the answer the Induce Act, the Hollings Bill, the Berman Bill, DRM? Is there some different answer? Whitney, what would you, how would you, you represent artists, um, you deal with them, you, you, on both sides, so both they're being sued, they're suing, representing them, making yeah, deals. I also, I also represent companies, too. And you represent, so represent companies, so. You know, really, kind of everybody here, the digital companies who are licensing these things, and mm -hmm. also record companies and publishing companies, so it's really kind of, not just artists, you know, right. it's kind of everybody. So, so what, what was your, I mean, if you had, if, you, if we made you copyright czar for a day, where, what would you be focusing your attention on? I would actually say that the best model to follow would be something along the lines of how the public performance rights are administered for musical compositions. And I think that uh, to go back to what we were talking about before, or uh, Tom and I, about, uh, about the, the, the way that different copyrights are treated, I personally think that one of the major problems here right now with music copyrights is that the fact that the, um, the sound recording copyright is much, much newer than the, than the uh, musical composition copyright. The sound recording copyright is really started in 1972 in America, and the performance right only started in, what, 98 or something. Uh, it was you know, very recent. Mm -hmm. And so I think what, what, um, what, what I think is that the, the musical composition copyright has been, uh, the, the, the monopoly power of it has been, um, the, the sharp edges have been dulled, you know, like, uh, like a, a piece of glass on the beach or something, mm -hmm. where it's not so sharp and it's not cutting you anymore. Because what it does is it lets people, it lets anyone who wants to record a song record a song. Mm -hmm. It lets anyone who wants to have a public performance of a song uh, uh, have a public performance. You know, I would, I would, I would wonder, um, hypothetically, what happened if, what, you know, what would, what would Tom want, how would Tom want things to work if radio was invented today? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and if it, was, if it was invented today, you know, how would that get licensed? Mm -hmm. It's a mess. I mean, I can tell you from ex great experience that musical composition copyrights, finding out who owns them mm -hmm. and contacting the licensor mm -hmm. and getting them, if you're dealing with any great number of copyrights, like you know, working on a project where we're, we're licensing about a quarter million copyrights, Mm -hmm. It's taken years and, you know, massive legal fees, which mm -hmm. is great for us, but not great for <laughs> culture, you know, uh, and we can move on to do more interesting things. I mean, I think that, that uh, the way that the, the, um, the PROs work with the, with the, with the consent decrees, mm -hmm. uh, basically requiring that there's a license, you know, a license has to be granted if somebody wants it, uh, and that... A, uh, that the license has to be on non-discriminatory terms. Mm -hmm. And any copyright owner who wants to be included in that license has to be allowed to be included. There's no boys club here or anything mm -hmm. like that. You know, you can get in there and do that. I think that that sort of structure for, uh, for the sound recording copyright as well, at least with respect to public performances, would be fantastic. And it would enable a lot of different things. And I think as, as an aside here, well, not really an aside, it's an essential point here. I think that that the view of what's actually occurring on the net is generally not understood correctly as a matter of copyright law. Mm. Uh, I believe that what's happening when you have a, um, a say, a peer-to-peer -peer system, you know, what happens is you, you read in the press all the time and you even see it in cases where they talk about distributing copies. Copies aren't being distributed, not in a copyright sense. Uh, the, the right to distribute is the right to distribute copies and phono records. And if you look at the definitions, copies and phono records are physical things. They move, you know, it's, it's this. Uh, what's actually happening in a peer-to-peer -peer system is that uh, the one part of one peer is making public performances and the other peer is, co is making copies. And so when you look at it that way, we, you know, you really see, or at least I think that what we're really talking about here is not the unauthorized distribution of copies. Mm -hmm. It's the unauthorized public performance of, uh, of these uh, works. And I think that when you see it that way, now you can look back at how that public performance problem has been solved before. And that's where I think you get, you know, that the, the way that ASCAP and BMI works is extremely efficient. Look at all the broadcasters out there. There's, you know, cable everywhere. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, so really cut thousands. down on the transaction costs, uh, make it simpler. I, let, let's very quickly see if we can get responses from Professor Jenkins and, and Mr. Sidner on sort of changes that you would like to see. And then, Jackson, how long do we have? Okay.
and then we'll very have a, a brief uh, conversation for the audience. So it, if you can, you know, and uh, I realize re revamping copyright law is not easily kept yeah. to a minute or so, but if you can give me your quick takeaway sound bites, Professor Jenkins. Solution to the P2P problem in five words or yes. Um, I agree with um, Whitney in terms of the broad concept that some sort of streamlined licensing scheme that gets the money from the people who want to use music to the money to the people who, who hold rights in the music is the kind of solution, is, is, is a good idea and a good solution. So the question is, what are the nuts and bolts of that going to look like? Mm -hmm. And it's extremely complicated. I'm not going to summarize it all, but there are a number of very interesting proposals out there, ranging from a sort of levy system that would actually tax things that you use to download, so your, so your mm -hmm. MP3 player or your, your ISP connection or whatever, and take money that way and give it to the rights holders on the basis of popularity. There are other proposals that are sort of voluntary collective licensing proposals where if people want to opt in and use music legally, they can pay their monthly fee and that music gets distributed. And so the, the, the devil is in the details and there are a lot of really interesting proposals out there from EFF, from um, Harvard's professor Terry Fisher, various other people that um, I commend to you and that's another interesting issue, but I agree in larger concept with Whitney that some sort of streamlined licensing mechanism that is fair, non-discriminatory, one-stop shop on the part of users so that we, you know, you just, you know what to do, you and I who want to use So you're music. dealing with it on the demand side rather yeah, than the on the supply side. Yeah, the demand side, side. Rather, rather than having to, to cut through the tangle of rights that we've been describing. Mr. Sidner? Um, yeah, uh, basically that argument is, the argument is essentially, um, well gosh, we, we imposed a bunch of, uh, of, of, of restraints on private prop, on the, um, uh, utilization of private property rights, and it's made such a mess that we should do it again and do it more. Um, I, I don't buy that. Uh, I, I, I think that is, I think to a certain, I mean, this is, these proposals tend to sound good, uh, and when you hear them, um, let's just make them give me all the music I want at a price that somebody says is fair. Um, but, you know, uh, to, to, to really answer them fully, you have to go back in, take, and, I, and I urge everybody to do this because they're just not going to have time today. Go back and look carefully. There was a huge debate about these issues at the, at the, in the middle of the last century about whether it's really a good idea to give people private property rights and force them to compete in a market where, gosh, you've got to get somebody's permission to use something valuable that they've created. That debate was had. Uh, and it was fought intellectually, and then it was fought in the real world. The outcome, I, I think, in the, at least in the real world, is pretty dispositive. Uh, and the, you know, the, the notion that, and, and you know, I've, uh, having worked in the government, the notion that, that you really want the government basically taxing your technology, monitoring your use of expressive works, these schemes require the government to watch you, right? They're going to keep a list of everything you watch. Professor Fisher's proposal that, that, uh, that was just mentioned, um, he says that the surveillance will have to be, will have to be very hard to disable because otherwise you'll miss it when you're, when you're watching. You won't rep if, you, if the surveillance is at all um, voluntary, you won't re voluntarily report your use of pornographic or juvenile programs. That's what we're talking about here. Um, when you get it, when, when you hear that the, de the devil's in the details, yeah, there are a lot of devils in the details. And the closer you look at them, the bigger they get. So, I mean, I, I urge everybody to just take a very close look at those proposals. And take a close look at the economics of this. Um, it, it's not as complex as it may appear. Um, as far as what I would do if I were copyright czar, um, you know, I, I guess what I would do is, is make, is, um, try to make sure that the copyright czar didn't have to figure all this out. <laughs> that the, that, that the, the, you know, the self-interest and the, the, uh, the brilliance of everybody in the economy could be brought to bear on these problems because they're stunningly difficult. They're not easy. And I'm not saying they're one-sided. And I'm not saying they're easy solutions to them. I'm not just saying proprietize everything and it'll be marvelous. Um, it's complicated stuff. but. Um, I think we're basically on the right track, um, and right now with the Grokster case, we've worked out a, a compromise that makes no one entirely happy, um, which is always a sign of a good compromise. Um, uh, and as a result of that, I think there's reason to hope going forward that we can have that that there, that. 
creative effort will focus more on finding innovative ways to resolve some of the tangle of rights, provide people with what they want legally, less on how to make a quick buck off of encouraging uh, other people to steal content. Um, I think that's a good thing on a going forward basis. So Tom, um, let me, can I just sort yeah. of ask a question here? So basically you're saying everything's fine. That actually, to me, seems like the most radical position that anyone on this panel said, <laughs> of saying like, you know what, uh, we have this great new law, and I think everything's going to be fine. No one's going to be file sharing tomorrow oh, no. because now there's this law and, and everything's all good. No, no, no. I mean, you know, I, I mean, what? call me crazy, but it seems like you're kind of sticking your head in the sand there. No, I, no, no, no. I, I'm not saying everything's going to be fine. Actually, everything is going to be completely mucked up. Um, one thing, if you look back, the, the last time this was all debated out, Joseph Schumpter, an economist, uh, famous for his little notion of creative uh, destruction. Uh, he's defending the notion of why it is that a capitalistic economic system um, will out-innovate any other form. Uh, and he's talking about that essentially what you do is that through the exchange of property rights, you move things to their optimal, you know, to their optimal uses. Profit motive creates sort of this cascade of incentives to keep on innovating because the system can't hold still. And he makes one point that's, that I think is critical to understanding what we're all living through right now, and that's that you can only evaluate the effectiveness of the system over a long period of time. When you look at it at, at any given moment, it's a mess. Uh, and if you think about that, he's absolutely right. Private property rights have delayed the deployment of every communications technology ever existed. Railroads, roads, um, landline telephones, uh, cable systems, all delayed in some ways by pesky old private property rights. And yet, those who relied on them okay. ended up grinding those who did not into the ground. So I think, but I, I mean, I, I think that's good. I think we, we, we have time for a couple of questions. Let me just, let me just add my own, um, so I've been trying to play the role of moderator here, add my own thought here. I do think that there's one enormous red herring here. The question is not about private property or no private property. Um, the only maybe Professor Fisher's uh, proposal uh, uh, raises something which, which is truly not doing private property, but the debates about the d details of copyright law and how to do it is not about that. Rather it is, and this is I think something that Schumpeter and others have always understood, the question is how to define those private property rights. Right? So I think it's truly a red herring, and I think it, it actually ill serves the debate, to be honest, for the following reason. If you looked at the briefs in cases like Grokster, in cases like Eldred versus Ashcroft, you would not see the kind of breakdown that's suggested by saying it's a private property versus no private property. You had, for example, the Eagle Forum, libertarian not known as anti-private property, opposing copyright term extension, right? You had the Cato Institute split down the middle on these issues, right? So, I mean, I think, to be honest, one of the great things about this, from my point of view, is that it isn't the kind of stereotyped, um, you know, it's all commies versus the free market. That's just not what's going on. Rather, what it is, is well-meaning people saying, how do we define these private property rights? And I think that has to be the point. On Mr. Sidner's point at the end, I would have to agree wholeheartedly, um, both as to the invocation of Schumpeter and to the fact that you have to look in a long time frame and to the fact that the way to deal with this is, in fact, through private property. The question is, of what design. Now, I apologize, we don't have long for questions. I'm gonna try and squeeze in a couple. Um, so, questions. So you said uh, earlier that the, the Grokster decision wasn't really going to affect anyone in this room. Right. And so as a computer scientist, I'm going to have to disagree here. Okay. Um, now, you know, Napster wasn't really the, the, the first search engine for copyrighted material. They were just kind of the first Enron of search engines. They were greedy enough to break the law and stupid enough to write it down. Um, <laughs> but you know, one of your other Fair. points was yeah. that you know, if, if we draw these bright lines, we're going to create all these fagans who will escape uh, the law because they'll know exactly what to do to not be found guilty. But at the same time, doesn't that mean that all the well-intentioned people who you know, want to create something new can understand what the law means and innovate around that without actually having to, to go through the court system? I mean, on one hand, you're saying the government shouldn't answer this, but on the other hand, you're saying the courts should answer this. Uh, and, and I'm trying to, to see how you reconcile those two sure. views. 
Uh, no, I'm. I'm not saying. Uh, let me. Let me just be clear about what. Because you're right. I, I wasn't. I wasn't very. I wasn't very clear earlier, and I apologize for it. What I meant was the, the Supreme Court certainly had authority to resolve the issues that were before it. Um, if more safe harbors are, you know, if, if, if some sort of safe harbor were to prove to be desirable or something that technologists want, that's the sort of thing that Congress has done. And if you look at the way the Copyright Act has evolved, uh, it's done it a lot. Uh, it's not just the, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And remember, again, we were talking about Internet services. If you need certainty, you always have those. I and mean, they're always available. Um, it, it, and so I guess what I would say is if you're looking at, if you're, you know, how, do I, how, do I be sh how can I be sure? How can I be certain? And, and I think the answer is, you know, think about what you're doing. And, and if what you're doing is thinking, I'm, you know, I got a great way that I can make a buck out of, uh, or, or maybe even not, you know, make, become famous or whatever the motive, you know, uh, might be um, uh, off of um, the um, you know uh, off of uh, distributing this mechanism for encouraging others to infringe copyrights. You've got a problem, and quite frankly, it's not just a civil problem; it's a bigger problem. If you don't, you don't have a problem. And I, I realize that that is not an entirely satisfying answer. And yes, uh, theoretically, you have to litigate it. But the truth of the matter is. Uh, it's a choice between doing it that way or letting the bad guys go. Uh, and a lot of people thought that was the right answer. Well, I, I, I guess my point is that this takes kind of a naive view of the technology industry where the standard is if you distribute something with the intent to infringe, then the producers are liable. But in today's software industry, the producers aren't always the same as the distributors. You know, IBM distributes Linux and a whole bunch of other open source software. So if I contribute to open source software and then somewhere down the line somebody does something stupid with it and says, look, infringe copyright with this great new tool, then why am I going to be held liable to that? Or am I going to be held liable to no, that? I don't, I don't the think court you, standard yeah. says that I should be. No, I don't think you would be because you know, you're, one of the things that is pretty clear uh, is that you know, secondary liability you're, you're, is, is it does, the doctrine that's allowed, designed to allow you to go after kind of the first bad actor. Um, you don't get to go back all the way up. The, Judge Patel talks about this in the aftermath of the Napster case. You know, no tertiary liability. You don't go, go and get to back all the way up the chain of commerce and get people who you know, probably didn't intend to do anything. Although I would point out actually that Bertelsmann is getting sued for, uh, and the, and the, the investors in Napster are getting sued, so that seems to me to be sort of a level of tertiary well, liability. No, that's, that's because the, argu the, the argument there is that they actually took over the, that they were actually m managing Napster while it was infringing. The argument that they could be held liable simply for investing in it, that was rejected. Yeah. Um, one more at the back. Yeah, Nick. Is there a joint uh, liability for the secondary liability? So would you get Rodster suing its users to recoup the site as a, as a cost shifting? I mean, is that, is that what's going on? Or is there, is that, would that be barred that sue the individual users that are, that are the direct? Sue their own users? Well, yeah, that are, that, I mean, that, that have made Grogster liable because these are the direct infringers. Is there a system of joint and several liability? Yeah, there is. I mean, so are we looking at, is, are we really talking about, you know, bringing the person that's guilty or are we talking about cost shifting when we, when the court created a, like, when the court came down with Grogster decision? But, yeah, I mean, remember that to, to, to win that case, uh, I mean, Grokster's got to show that, you know, the users are worse than it. Not an easy showing under these circumstances. Uh, it, it is theoretically, yeah, you're right. Theoretically, it's a problem. And if, it, if for example, there were some utterly innocent uh, party that were to be swept in under an, an, an inducement theory because, you know, the bad act of its users, theoretically, it would have a right, I think. Okay. But that's, you know, there's no real law on that. So I, I think we should... We should uh, finish up so that we don't we don't go over the time too much. I, I I think if it's obviously a rich and complex discussion, and each of the panelists here, as you've seen, could could uh, talk fascinatingly about it for hours. I guess for me, the the final point that I'd leave you with is there's really two themes here that for me run, frankly, in opposite directions. On the one hand, we believe strongly in the idea of property rights or the form of property known as intellectual property for all the reasons that I think um, have been discussed. One of the things that we often say with property rights is that the single most important thing is that the boundaries of those property rights be clear. 
That's one of the things that property theorists tell us again and again. If you want development, if you want economic exploitation, if you want vigorous uh, development of your <laughs> land or of your technology, property rights need to be clear. On the other hand, as Mr. Sidner very articulately and, and convincingly argued, the danger about having clear property rights as those property rights uh, include the right to control the actions of third parties, which is, of course, after all, what's really going on with the secondary liability. This is part of the bundle of rights. Is that we know that there are arguments to, there are arguments in favor of vagueness that we don't want to tell you because if we tell you, then you'll just work around it. Those two tendencies really are, I think, in flat fundamental conflict here. On the one hand, the concern to not allow people specifically to sit down and design networks so as to um, get around legal rules. But on the other hand, the very private property theorists who tell us that private property is the best way to organize tell us that the key to this private property, if it's going to be well organized, is it has to be well defined and its limits have to be known. I think with that, uh, I'd like you to ask us to thank the panelists.